So why am I making a video about Bitcoin, especially since I'm not a technologist or even an amateur techie? If anything, I'm somewhat anti-technology, not like Ted Kaczynski level or anything. I just think it's really important for people to find time throughout their day to be alone with themselves, which is why I still have a flip phone, because you can't spend time being alone in your own mind when you're constantly fixated on a handheld computer. So anyway, I'm making this video because I got myself a Bitcoin wallet uh, about a year ago in case someone wanted to support my channel using Bitcoin. And when I recently checked it, someone had finally sent me some coin. Now it was only a few bucks worth, but still, I found it pretty cool. Kind of like that first dollar bill you make in frame when you open your own restaurant. And also, that donation reminded me of how I became familiar with Bitcoin in the first place, which was sometime in 2015 when I watched a segment on some news show that talked about it, but explained very little. Where does Bitcoin come from? If it's not backed by gold, or even the government, what even makes it valuable? How is it different from PayPal? After watching that TV segment in 2015, I still had those questions, and more, so I did my own research, and what I found was one of the coolest stories I've ever heard. So in honor of whoever sent me my first coins, I'm going to share that story with you now. So first of all, what is Bitcoin? Well, from a user perspective, Bitcoin is like cash, which can be transferred globally via the internet without going through any middleman or bank. And unlike debit cards or PayPal, Bitcoins, which are in essence long strings of numbers, don't represent money being held somewhere. They are money. This is totally unique and has never been done before. And because Bitcoins are like cash in your pocket, there's no account that can be frozen and no personal data that can be stolen when using them. By the way, Bitcoins can be kept in a digital wallet on a computer or mobile device, which can be backed up and encrypted. And spending them is as simple as scan and pay or sending an email. Now, behind the scenes, there's no central authority or developer that has the ability to manipulate the Bitcoin network to increase their profits. The Bitcoin network is secured by individuals called miners who are rewarded with newly generated Bitcoins for verifying transactions. And with specialized hardware, anyone can mine. Confirmed Bitcoin transactions need to be included in a block along with a mathematical proof of work. The proofs are difficult to generate because there's no way to create them other than by trying billions of calculations per second. A complex algorithm controls the difficulty of the math puzzles by accounting for increases in the number of miners and for newer and more powerful computers. This makes mining inherently costly and keeps it extremely competitive. After transactions are verified, they are recorded in a transparent public ledger called the blockchain. This ledger contains every transaction ever processed. Bitcoins are created at a decreasing and predictable rate, which mimics the scarcity and value of precious metals, and shields from hyperinflation. The number of new Bitcoins created each year is automatically halved over time until Bitcoin issuance halts completely around 2140, when a total of exactly 21 million Bitcoin have been created. Bitcoin's value lies in its ability to be transferred for free, in real time, without an intermediary, and anonymously, if so desired. Now, nobody owns the Bitcoin network like nobody owns the technology behind email. And the Bitcoin network is the biggest distributed computing project in the world today. Banks and other intermediaries make money by providing the element of trust between two parties in a transaction. The Bitcoin network makes the role of the middleman in the transaction obsolete. Netscape founder Mark Anderson explained it this way. Bitcoin is the first practical solution to a long-standing problem in computer science called the Byzantine Generals problem. The practical consequence of solving this problem is that Bitcoin gives us, for the first time, a way for one internet user to transfer a unique piece of digital property to another internet user, such that the transfer is guaranteed to be safe and secure, 
everyone knows that the transfer has taken place and nobody can challenge the legitimacy of the transfer. The consequences of this breakthrough is hard to overstate. IBM began working on cryptocurrencies and the idea of digital coins or tokens in the 1980s. And in the early 1990s, top programmers from Apple, Microsoft, and the government, some using their real name, others were anonymous, got together on one of the first online forums and they focused on cryptography and digital currencies. But they ran into several problems. They couldn't overcome the possibility of copying digital coins or tokens. The counterfeiting problem is as old as currency and the attributes of digital makes it perfect for copying. And a currency that can be perfectly copied is worthless. Another problem they found to be even more difficult to solve was double spending. Double spending is like copying and pasting the currency or transaction and spending it more than once at the same time. Since transactions on the internet aren't instantaneous, the possibility that a transaction could be intercepted and then spent more than once before the original transaction is confirmed seemed unsolvable. After these experts realized the difficulties of creating a digital currency, the consensus became that it was likely impossible and enthusiasm faded. Out of the blue, on the 1st of November in 2008, in the middle of the global financial crisis, someone using a pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto posted a white paper with a detailed design of a digital currency he called Bitcoin to an obscure cryptography internet mailing list. Satoshi had totally solved the counterfeiting and double spending problems, and he had invented the world's first decentralized digital currency. By the way, none of the recipients of the white paper had previously heard of him, and the following year Satoshi uploaded the open source software to implement Bitcoin. For the next two years, Nakamoto worked with a group of core developers via the internet. Then, without warning, he went silent. Not even the most savvy hackers and computer tracking experts could find a trace of him. Though Satoshi is a male Japanese name, even gender is a mystery. Some have suggested Satoshi must be a group, citing the elegance of the algorithms coupled with the brilliance of the Bitcoin design would be too much for one person to produce. Regardless, in the world of digital geniuses, Satoshi Nakamoto is legendary. And though no one knows exactly what Satoshi was thinking, interestingly though, his solution can be traced back to Napster, the file sharing site where people could download music for free and which was shut down by the government in 2001. And the reason it was shut down so easily was because it was centralized. It used a central index server, so when the server was unplugged, it was over. Having learned from Napster's mistakes, the BitTorrent Corporation, which came online shortly after the demise of Napster, solved the centralized problem. Instead of basically storing files in a central location, BitTorrent software chopped all files into tiny pieces and stored them on users' computers all around the world. With this technology, there is nothing to be unplugged. From Satoshi's writings, we know that he clearly understood how banks work. He knew money wasn't the important or centralized part of the bank. The ledger was. That's their real asset. That's where they control the money. And the ability for banks to access their ledgers and manipulate them is what makes them powerful and dangerous. So Satoshi's genius was turning the way banks work inside out. Satoshi did with the ledger what BitTorrent had done with media files. And he did it by pairing two old technologies, proof of work and elliptic curves, and applying them to the ledger. Proof of work solved the double spending problem, and elliptic curves solved unique access to the ledger. By focusing exclusively on the ledger, Satoshi took the perceived weakness of digital in relation to currency, its ability to make perfect copies, and turned it into massive strength. 
The ability for everyone to instantly make perfect copies of the Bitcoin ledger ensures its integrity. So money is replaced with access to specific ledger units. And anyone trying to defraud the system by creating a forged ledger will instantly be found out because it won't match the ledger available to everyone. There has never been anything like this ledger or blockchain before. Something truly decentralized where nothing controls or needs to protect it. Just code running everywhere. Now I know this video doesn't come close to answering all questions, but I hope it gave those of you who didn't really know a lot about Bitcoin a little better understanding of not only what it is, but why, after doing some research, I found it so cool. Now on a completely different topic, the question, what makes Marxism and Marxist ideals so appealing to people, is swirling around in my head and will be the topic of my next editorial video. So please stay tuned and thanks for watching. Talk to you all soon. Tschüss.